Hey folks, Kevin here. Well, it's August 11th, 2021. It's been very hot and dry for a long period of time. Last night we got some rain and we got a little bit of rain this morning. Hallelujah. And today what I thought I'd do is address a couple of questions I got regarding tap roots. Uh, in the past I've talked about, uh, I've posted videos showing that I've taken all different size trees from very small trees that are only 18 to 24 inches long and having like a four foot long tap root on it and then transplanting to trees that are tw over 20 feet tall and ha having success with those as well so um so this video is going to be focused on the tap root ideas what you know what what sort of thought processes i have uh so let me read the first question here so cj M-I-H-A-L-K-O. I apologize, I don't think I can pronounce that correctly. Do you think that the tree would survive if you cut the taproot off a couple of feet down? Um, so, and this was in response to the pawpaw taproot video that I posted. So, it all depends. <laughs> like most things in life, everything's dependent on multiple factors. So I thought I'd go over some of those factors to start out with. The, f the first factor I would say is if you're electing to transplant a tree and uh, I would say plant it all out ahead of time. Like our, gr our ground is so rough and rocky and all, there's a very good chance I'm going to damage the tap roots when I dig them out. So first thing I would say is number one, do your transplant do your transplants when the trees are dormant, after the leaves have fallen off. That requires, when, when the plant is in a dormant state, the roots don't have to do as, as much functioning. There's less functioning requirements during the dormant season. So that's the timing to, have a, to, to maximize your, your chances of success. <clears throat> the other thing I would say is, uh, when you're transplanting a, a tree, I would recommend using mycorrhizal fungi, a mixed uh, endo and ecto mycorrhizal uh, spores that you can get online. I'll try to remember to put a link to, to one of them in the description below. What the mycorrhizal uh, fungi does is whatever roots are remaining, and this, these are basically the small hair roots that are there, the, as the spores come in contact with, the, uh, with those small hair-like roots, they will germinate, just like a seed germinates, and the filaments will extend the functional capacity of those small hair roots and provide the tree with more, uh, more volume, uh, with a greater volume of area where nutrients and water can be absorbed by the, by the trees. So number one, do it when it's dormant. Number two, if you want to enhance your, your chances, use mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, the spores have to, the inoculant, the spores need to be uh, come in contact with the roots, uh, with the root surface. Uh, so those are a couple of things that I would say that really help to enhance things. The other thing is, it really depends on how much how, how much there has to be supported above. So if you're limiting the amount, let's say you're taking off 50% um, of the taproot and there, there, and this taproot doesn't have lots of lateral branches that are going out to the sides. Well then I would recommend pruning that tree pretty significantly because the resources from the root surface won't necessarily meet the requirements of the branches and the leaves that are going to develop on, on that tree. So you want to decrease the resource dependency and increase the resource reserves. So the mycorrhizal fungi does that. Decreasing dependency is by, by doing it during uh, dormant season and by pruning it as much as, as you feel is appropriate. So. The other thing is, uh, when you're transplanting trees, especially the larger the tree, well, any size tree, the more soil that's, that's left with the root ball, the better. Then you're not dislodging, disrupting, damaging the small little microscopic root hairs that are extending out. 
when we think of a big tap root, we think of this big uh, uh, conical uh, ice cream cone shaped uh, structure. Uh, and that's the, 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 the place where everything's coming into, but it's all of those extensions, the small ha root hairs and the lateral branches that are going out that are, that are much are of greater f uh, function. Um, the other thing I would say is be mindful of damaging the bark of the tree when you're, when you're doing this. Small nicks and dings aren't a big deal. Uh, but uh, as I've shown in videos before, when you scratch the bark, you see that bright green color underneath the surface of the bark, and that's the cambium layer, and that's the xylem and phloem. Though that's the circulatory system of the of the of the plant. So that circulatory system connects the the leaves uh, through all through the trunk, through the branches, and all where photosynthesis can, can occur. And in order for photosynthesis to be, to be um, active, we need carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and we need water coming from the earth going up through the, through the, through the roots, going through the cambium layer, the xylem and phloem areas. And that way they do the photosynthesis and those simple sugars come down and go out through the root surfaces. And if you have mycorrhizal fungi, that will distribute the, those simple sugars to feed the microorganisms and feed other plants, and there's this be beautiful mutualism form of symbiotic relationship where both the plant and the microorganisms, as well as surrounding plants, all benefit from this relationship. So this circulatory system that you can see, you know it's a, the, the limb is alive or the trunk is alive when you scratch the bark and you see that bright green then you know that there's a good circulatory system there at this at this at this place that's analogous to an artery or a vein the arteries deliver blood to the tissues and the veins deliver that that used oxygen that the depleted oxygen uh, blood back to the uh, heart and then it pumps to the to the, to the lungs and so on um, but but the main point that I want to make is that the arteries and veins, although we think of them as being the most important parts along with the heart uh, for keeping us alive, it's those small little vessels, those capillaries, that deliver all of the nutrients and oxygen to every tissue in our body. And it's not really the, the big arteries and veins that are doing the, the bulk of the work, it's all of the capillaries. If you take the capillaries and and uh, attach them all end to end and wrap around the earth twice at the equator of a human human being. So that gives you an idea of the massive extent of the capillary network in our circulatory system. And I would say that's fairly analogous to the small little ha root hairs that are on the plants. So <laughs> the bottom line is, excuse me, the bottom line that the way I see it is that the uh, that the cutting off a proportion of the main root is is significant, but it's not as significant as the uh, as the ex expansive um, surface area of the small little root hairs that are on that main uh, root. So some t some trees that I that I dig up we'll see you know, the, the main uh, taproot coming down and then we'll see branches coming off that have been, been uh, fairly significant. And those branches, and I'm talking about root branches, uh, those root branches is go ahead and split again and, and then small little root hairs form on it. So we have lots of lateral branching coming off of the, of the, of the taproot itself that's that's telling me that the expansive network, the, the length, the depth of that taproot isn't necessarily as vital as the rest of it. And I'm sorry this is long-winded, but I, I wanted to give you my thought processes about how I would deal. So dormancy, number one, mycorrhizal fungi to, to, to uh, spores to come in contact with the root surface. Pruning is appropriate. Planning the whole system out as, as much as possible and being aware that this is all part of the circulatory system of the plant. So that's the first question. Let me throw my glasses back on here. And Okay, this is from Brandy Isbell. 
Uh, great video, Kevin. I need your help. A couple of years ago, I found native persimmons tree where I was hunting. I germinated about eight seeds and have grown them for three years in containers. The tap roots are corkscrewed, corkscrewed terribly. I want to plant them this fall, but I don't know what to do about the tap roots in their condition. Please give me your advice. Uh, Brandy, I'm sorry it's taken me so long to get back to you. And, uh, but here's my thought. The, I, and I, I think what you mean is that in the pot, that the, that the tap root actually hit the bottom and then started circling around and, be, and be, became somewhat root bound. In those conditions, it's somewhat like on our property we have here. Uh, the, the, and I'll talk about high winds in a moment. But uh, our ground is so hard with so many big rocks that it's very common for that taproot to go down and then turn laterally, hit another rock, and then turn in different directions, and it will be real windy. I've dug up uh, taproots with my 18-inch bucket on uh, Bumblebee, my mini excavator, and dug up, dug up uh, an oak tree and find the, the taproot just uh, almost making a 90-degree turn off to the side. At first, I thought that I had broken that tapper, but I actually got it out almost intact, except for the little tip of it. But when I looked at it, I saw the, the tip of the taproot out to the side of the bucket and thought I, I, I broke the taproot and just bent it like this. I don't know, bent it like that. And, uh, but when I examined it, and because I was going to try and straighten it out, I saw that it had already bent, probably from hitting a rock and moving it laterally. So that didn't bother me. I did more damage by removing some of the soil to see if I could straighten out the taproot because I figured if as much circulation as I could get the uh, circulatory system, get it more aligned, things would do well. So I would say that I don't see it as being a huge problem. Uh, I, if they're in a pot and they're already in the container, I probably only if there's superficial roots that are that are wrapped around the outside of the box uh, outside of the soil block within the pot i would disrupt them a little bit but i wouldn't disrupt them as much as i would other non-taproot plants and and i would plant it uh, again i would do it in the in the fall or in the spring when the plant is dormant i would use mycorrhizal fungi to help out with it as well and it really depends on the soil type that it is. And I, and I forgot some, I forgot what I thought I was going to, oh, high wind areas. So we, ha, we have some really high wind areas. Now in the forest, we don't have those issues with the high winds because there's so many trees protecting each other, unless they do the domino effect and fall over. Uh, but in some parts of our property, if it's a, an oak tree, I really want to uh, have as much of that taproot being being down deep in the earth because that's what's what's going to help to keep the the part that's above the ground from catching too much and blowing over. So if you live in a high wind zone, I would plant the trees in places where you think that there will be something that will another tree. Let's say your winds come out of the northwest in the winter time. Uh, I would want another tree or a couple of objects to, in the northwest because as the wind hits it, it deflects the wind by about 15 degrees. And yes, that does create some turbulence, but that decreases the direct impact. The other thing I would say is that uh, if the trees have a lot, of, um, a lot of branching on them initially, and I don't like supporting trees with stakes. I've had lots of problems with that, and I can make a video about that if necessary. But, uh, but I would probably prune back the limbs as much as you can. And I'm one to talk about it because I don't get as much pruning done as I should get done around here. So, so training the tree to be narrower, if, if at all possible, and not be top heavy. So that's the thing. So three-year-old plants, hopefully they're, you know, uh, a persimmons that's growing in the ground right now that came up from uh, seed from this last season is about two and a half feet tall. So I'd say one and a half, three. So if you're about five, to, if they're about five, six feet tall, you're in good shape. You just don't want to have it be too bushy, too, too, too much uh, lateral, lateral branches going out 
in a newly potted plant. After all, you're going to want that tree, if you're going to get underneath it uh, and work in the tree, you're going to want to have the first limbs coming off probably at five or, or six feet high off the ground, as you've seen in some of my persimmons trees when I, when I uh, uh, harvest the fruit from them. So that's about it with my thoughts on the tap roots. Uh, I'll try to remember to put a link to the uh, mycorrhizal fungi in the description below. And if you have more questions about the tap roots, I'm happy to try again. I've just been going crazy here. I'm a little under the weather, so today I decided I was going to try and pump out a couple of videos and not go on out there in the heat. So, uh, if you found this video of value, please give us a thumbs up, share it with your friends. Uh, and just a reminder, if you shop on Amazon and you want to click on our Amazon affiliate link that's in the description, we get a small commission. It doesn't cost you anything more. It helps us out here as well. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate you all, and have a super fantastic day. Bye-bye now. Thank you.